Hello and welcome to Tools for Everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. My name is Kathleen Deppler and I am the Director of Positive Supports for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And I have my colleague with me today uh, to uh, co-facilitate. Catherine, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Catherine Earl and I'm a positive support consultant lead for, for the Eastern region. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Catherine. So I would uh, like to learn a little bit more about who else is here. And so I think that Kat, our wonderful host, is working on making it so that uh, y'all can chat box with everyone, not just the panelists. Um, but regardless of what you have access to now, I'd love to hear uh, who's here. So if you'd go ahead and find the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen and add your name and tell us where you're where you're from, uh, that'd be great. Um, I should have told you already I am in Kansas City. Uh, we're kind of bragging about that a lot these days. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so tell us who, who's here. And it looks like you should be able to chat box everyone. Thank you, Tiffany. Tiffany is in Weston. Nice, just up the road. Uh, St. Louis, Angelique, thank you. I, we have both, uh, both sides of I-70 now covered. Please everyone put your, um, whatever you put in the chat, please make sure that you put it to everyone and not just the host. If you, yeah, if you do just to the host, only Kat will get it. Hi, Chad. Chad's in St. Louis, too. And Mitchell, great. Lots of St. Louis. Okay, you guys are in South City, very specific part of St. Louis. I like it. Okay. Oh, lots of St. Louis. Okay. Well, wonderful. Uh, it's nice to see uh, folks from all around the state today. Uh, thanks, Bridget. And, uh, okay, a bunch of y'all are together. Wonderful. Okay, well. Um, it's exciting to see some St. Louis. We've got some Rolla too. So we got a little bit of the southern part of the state there in Farmington. Okay. Welcome, Angela in Farmington. Great. Good group of folks here. Another Kansas City and I see Sydney is in KC. Welcome. Okay. Um, well, wonderful. I'm really glad that you guys are here today. And I'm really excited that you already found the chat box because we're going to use that throughout the class today to uh, to do a little interaction and make sure we're um, all everybody's on the same page as we go through this. So what you can expect today, you're going to stay muted. Um, that's going to be really easy to do because Kat made it so nobody can unmute. Um, just because you're not muted doesn't mean you can't participate, though. You already used the chat box, and I'd love it if you'd keep doing that. Another idea that I think would be helpful would be if you had some paper for some notes, uh, you know, paper or, you know, something just to type on. Um, it'll be helpful because I think there might be some things you want to take notes on today, as well as we're going to do a couple of activities, and it might be good to kind of put your thoughts on paper like that. So th what we're going to learn today. Uh, this is an overview of, of, of a positive support strategy called Tools of Choice, which uh, the full class is an approved positive behavior support curriculum uh, through the division. This class here is an overview, though, so this does not count as the required positive behavior support curriculum for direct care staff, um, and it's a great start, so um, you're going to get a lot of really good information today. It just this class does not count towards your positive behavior support curriculum. Um, we are going to cover some fundamental facts about behavior. So some just things that we know are true and that guide the strategies that we're going to share with you. We are going to talk about four ways to categorize behavior, and we're going to talk about that because it is helpful to identify what type, what category of behavior um, you're observing in order to um, choose what kind of response you might provide. So we're going to talk about four categories of behavior, and that'll help you target particular behaviors for change. We're also going to talk about coercion and punishment, and we're going to talk about their effects. And when we do that, then uh, it will become quite clear why we're asking you to avoid them. We're going to share 10 specific examples of coercions that we all use. Um, so some things we're going to try to avoid doing in the future after we learn about them today. And then we're also going to share some strategies that are proactive and preventative, help us uh, improve our relationships, improve the interactions, and increase the likelihood that we're going to see desirable behavior in our environment. So the good overview um, that'll leave you with a few things that you can leave here today um, practicing yourself. 
So what is positive behavior supports? There's a lot that goes into this definition. So the, the science of behavior or behavior analysis has been formally investigated and demonstrating the science of behavior since the 1940s. There have been hundreds of thousands of articles, studies uh, that demonstrate these principles and techniques and many programs are, are implementing them. So schools, training curriculums, um, treatment programs, uh, all using the science of behavior and the, the principles that we're gonna talk about today. And then as positive behavior support, um, that program, this program uses the, the public health model to structure intervention. So a good way to explain this is to look at that triangle down at the bottom. So um, if you look at that, the green base there, it represents the universal strategies. Those are things that we all need, everybody in the population needs for a high quality of life. And in a healthy population, 80 to 90% of people will need only this universal level of support. And then if you go up uh, right above that green, you're gonna see the yellow, and that yellow represents the population at risk for poor outcomes. And so th this uh, group of folks um, need interventions that often look like just an extra scoop of that universal. So an extra scoop of that universal that's just targeted um, for a short period of time and then faded as, as risk decreases. And in a healthy population, 10 to 15% of people are gonna need that extra scoop. They're gonna need that extra bit of support. And then up at the top, that red section, that is the red, the, that is the red, that is the, uh, represents the group of people in crisis, people who need and um, uh, that need a targeted intervention. They need it, um, there's a word I'm, I'm looking for. Um, they need intensive, they need an a intensive level of support short term again and faded as risk decreases um, and in a healthy population about five percent or fewer people are going to need that level of support so it's important to understand these levels these tiered supports these levels of support because today we're going to focus on this green level this universal level so the content that we're going to share today is what everybody needs uh, for a high quality of life and it really is the foundation for all the other interventions that a person might need in order to uh, have a high, high quality of life. So it's not going to solve all of your problems. It is the base of all of the other interventions that you might, that a person might need. So uh, this, this approach can be difficult for people to accept. Um, the, the focus of, of it is on being kind and caring all the time. Um, and sometimes that can um, leave people with the idea that people are getting away with their undesirable behavior. And in reality, it's just a shift in focus. We, we don't have to be mean or cold um, when people are angry or upset in order for them to understand that that's not what you're looking for. Being kind and non-emotional can be more effective in calming situations and it's also unlikely to make the situation worse right now or in the future. So our goal is to be kind and caring all the time. And that means we keep our cool and we don't get emotional even when things feel very emotional um, and very personal. Um, we wanna avoid the, the attempt to get even or try to hurt them back. Um, and this is hard and it takes lifelong practice um, and it's just, it's really different than our culture and society currently operates. You know, in in popular culture, you see coercion left and right on in uh, on the TV. If you watch any sitcom out there, uh, however that teenager's problem was solved involves some coercion. Um, it's it's the way our penal system operates, uh, law enforcement. It's it's the way that our our society tends to operate, and so it's definitely a shift. Um, in our understanding and um, that can be difficult for people. So I encourage you to have an open mind um, and avoid cynicism, but you know, being skeptical and weighing the evidence I think is important. So I encourage you to be skeptical, but not cynical. 
So let's get into this. Tell me, I would go find your chat box again. What is behavior? If you had to explain the behavior to somebody who doesn't speak the verbal English language, how would you describe behavior? What, what is behavior? Give me your definition. Anything observable, Jennifer says. Something you can see, Tiffany says. A means of communication. Anything that can be seen and measured, Helen says. Observable and measurable. It's like you guys have been through the full tools class. These are like spot on definitions. Wow. Okay. A way a person acts. Body expressions of feelings. A response to stimuli. Wow. There's so much here. You guys are great. How someone displays emotion. Uh, behavior is an action an individual does as a means to communicate one's emotions. Wow. There's a there's some real um, themes here. I'm picking up on feelings or emotions, a way a person acts, actions, things like that. Um, these are great. How you act, observable and measurable. So things you can see. Here's our definition that we're gonna that we're gonna uh, continue with. Anything a person does that can be seen and counted or measured and observed, as some people said, I like that. So anything a person does, and, and the important, I'm really um, emphasizing that word anything because it's really important that we expand our definition to anything a person does. We're going to shift our focus. That's what this tool's positive behavior support is asking us to do, to shift our focus. And so we really need to start thinking about behavior as anything a person does that can be seen and counted. Okay. So I'm going to shift back to my slide here, and I would like uh, you to give me some behaviors. I'm watching the chat box, and I'm just going to type whatever behaviors y'all put in here. So give me some behaviors. What are some behaviors? Anything a person does that can be seen and counted. Tapping, crying, yelling. Oh, wow, you guys are going fast. Ooh, hey, Catherine, would you mind calling those out to me? Um, that might... Help Absolutely. me. Absolutely. <laughs> <That's a lot. laughs> Thanks, guys. First thing. Right, we've got, we've got um, tapping and crying and screaming. You already got yelling, fidgeting, um, doom scrolling Twitter. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> um, hitting. Yelling, eating, you got those. Uh, throwing things, cursing, you got that. You guys have so many examples. It's so great. Yeah, this um, is great. You've got uh, in quotes attitude or running away. Uh, destroying property. I think we already got hitting. Yeah, we have hitting. We have with uh, withdrawing. Biting, pacing. Oh my goodness, there's so many. <laughs> this is great. Okay. Something, um, laughing. Okay, I'm gonna do laughing as my last one. Wow, this is, you guys are fabulous. I saw Pika, so I'm gonna add that just because I saw. Pika. Okay. So this is quite a list. I am going to, um, I'm gonna circle some. And as I circle them, I want you to identify, what, what do you notice about the ones that I'm circling? What do you notice about the ones I'm circling? Actions. Negative. Negative, Bridget says. Yeah, they can be measured. They can. They're also seen as negative, Ruth said. Okay, so yes, they're negative. So let's kind of, um, I'm going to finish this just so that we can kind of get a ratio. Um, when we think about behavior, how do we tend to think about it? Now, if you looked at what the majority of the ones that we came up with, um, you know, these probably are. We, we tend to think about behavior as a negative. So we're going to expand our definition and start thinking of all the things people do. 
Uh, and, um, and we've got our work cut out for us because it's hard. We often think about behaviors as negative, but we're going to expand our definition and we're going to think about behavior as anything a person does that can be measured and observed. Okay. I'm going to do another set of circling here, and this is a hard one. So I want you to think, what do you notice about the ones I'm circling now? That's different than the ones that I'm, that I'm not circling. Jennifer says there, it's a big physical. Jessica says, Jennifer says, um, no, 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 no. Jennifer says they're a big old category. Does anybody want to, she's on to something there. I think I got all the. Jennifer's on to something. She says it's a big old category. When I look at property destruction, um, that I think is a perfect example of a big old category. That could be so many things, you know. Um, um, for me, you know, property destruction could be as simple as, um, you know, throwing down a cup on the floor and milk spills everywhere, and that's property destruction. Someone else might not define property destruction until it starts to... Uh, um, you know, uh, add up to some amount of money and, you know, in the legal sense of property destruction. Jennifer says uh, the cursing could be different from someone else's exactly. Like, it's not cursing to me until it's, um, you know, been on George Carlin's list. But for some people, you know, saying, um, well, now I can't, I don't want to cuss because it's different in the eye of the beholder, right? So cussing is different um, based on your own personal definition. And so when I, these ones that I circled, they are categories of behavior. They don't tell us specifically what a person is doing. And so it's really important when we talk about behavior that we talk about behavior in specific actions versus big old categories. One reason is it helps us remove the judgment. You know, somebody didn't throw a tantrum. That sounds pretty judgmental, especially if you're saying it about an adult. Uh, but they, you know, sat in their seat and had a, uh, it, uh, their face looked angry and they said, no, 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 no. And and um, that was the, tan the tantrum. It's important that everybody understands and knows what's going on. Uh, documentation is important. It's also just if we talk about behavior in measurable specific terms and specific actions, then we're able to see changes in behavior over time. If I just say that that person who's sitting there and saying no, 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 no is having a tantrum, over time, I won't be able to see the nuances of how that behavior changes and hopefully improves. They they only said no once, and then they they their face didn't look so angry. Or you know, there's there's many specific actions that are happening when we use terms that describe them. Then everybody knows what's happening, and we're able to see changes over time. So instead of being like Kathleen was rude, uh, you know we could say that she looked and said, look at her, what is she wearing? And she like had this judgy face on and she, uh, you know, said those mean things about the person and they could hear. So, you know, a step in the right direction might be that Kathleen writes those things down or Kathleen um, says it in a, in a whisper voice. You know, that would be an improvement to the saying it so loud that the, the person could hear, right? So it's important to talk about specific actions so everybody knows what's happening and we're able to see changes over time. Now, sometimes it's helpful. I told you I was going to talk about the categories of behavior. It is helpful to have categories of behavior when you're um, thinking about how you might respond to those behaviors. And so we have four categories of behavior that help us lump behaviors in order to help us determine how we might respond. So our four categories of behavior are desirable, significant, big deal, big deals, things there, uh, big quality of life improvements for people. And then there's the just okay, that stuff that people just do because we're people and we do stuff. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we just expect. And then undesirable, we have serious, so things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And then we have junk, that's stuff that is not helpful, it is undesirable, we spend a lot of time on it. It's super annoying, but it is not 
physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And so we're categorizing it that way because based on the category, we're going to respond in a particular way. For that annoying junk stuff, we have a tool called Pivot. For that serious stuff, we have a tool called Stay Close Hat. So based on the category, we're going to respond with a particular uh, response. Okay, so remember, uh, it's, it's important to consider the context of the behavior. So when you think about these four uh, categories of behavior right here, I'm going to take one behavior and go between each of these. So significant desirable behavior for Kathleen would be going to the gym. If Kathleen went to the gym, it would be a quality of life improvement for her. It's not something that I do all the time. Um, so it's definitely like an improvement. It would be like something to target. Um, significant desirable behavior for me. Takes a lot of effort, uh, big impact. Just okay. If when Patrick Mahomes goes to the gym, it's just okay. He goes to the gym all the time. He's fit and healthy and not a big deal. He still needs an attaboy every no once in a while for his just okay behavior. But for him, going to the gym is just okay. Now, let's shift over here to undesirable. When could going to the gym be undesirable? Well, it could be junk if the person's just going to the gym to, to like check out other people or hit on them. That's junk. It's super annoying and gross. It's not socially acceptable. And, um, and, and nobody likes that. That's junk. It's not physically harmful but is not socially acceptable. Then when could when could going to the gym be serious behavior? It could be physically harmful. If, if Patrick Mahomes goes to the gym right now, it could be physically harmful, he is injured. So an injured person going to the gym against medical advice could be serious behavior. So based on the context of the environment that that behavior occurs in, who it's occurring with, it could really, most behaviors could really land across any of those different categories. So that's important to consider as you categorize behavior. So again, significant desirable behavior. These are the big deal things that we want to teach, model, motivate, increase. Uh, these are the quality of life improvers. And then there's the just okay. These are things that are probably already happening. Um, and when you think about these, what I really want you to do is consider them your opportunity to increase the positivity in the environment. These are things that we typically just expect to happen. And so we could start using these as our opportunity to provide a positive consequence or to just start engaging with people and creating more positivity in the environment. So these are things we really wanna be on the lookout for and uh, start using as a cue or a prompt in your environment. The junk is the stuff that we spend a lot of time on, is annoying and stressful and, um, we have a tool called pivot for these. So these are the things that are not helpful to a person. Um, and I don't mean junk, like get rid of it. I mean, junk, like it's the stuff that weighs us down and we spend a lot of time on it and it's really annoying and unhelpful. Um, so I think we had a lot of junk behaviors on our list and I'm going to navigate back there real quick and let's see what kind of junk behaviors we had. When you look at this list, which one of these do you consider to be junk? When you think about those categories I just gave you. What are things that are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or legal? They're definitely not helpful. They're weighing us down. Um, which ones are these? Yelling. Yes, Jessica. Great. Yes. Yelling is a great example. Doom scrolling Twitter. Amen. Yes, that is a junk behavior. It's not helpful. Twitter in general. <laughs> um, Michael Mitchell said, uh, yelling, screaming, crying, cursing, pacing, tapping, clapping, stomping. Yes, great. Those are all. Um, junk behaviors you know running away is a big old category kind of like eloping really depending on how that looks some of the steps in that um, might can be junk uh cursing yes ruth yes okay so we spend a lot of time on junk those are the things that stick out to us um it's just really good for us to keep thinking about that so here's some other examples of junk behavior cursing threatening we we had some of these um, there's a couple knots in here. Not going to work is a, a good example of junk. It's not physically harmful, but it's definitely not helpful. Um, name calling, saying mean things, etc. So let's consider why do people do this stuff? Why do people curse? Why does somebody curse or complain or slam a door? Why does somebody do junk behavior? You can tell me in the chat box. Why are people doing this stuff? Venting. Yep, Sheena. Yeah. Expressing themselves, Jessica says. Yeah, habit. 
Ellen says a habit, frustration, yep. Because they've seen others do it, Jessica says. Upset, sensory needs. Um, cursing literally relieves pain, Bruce says. So yeah, this stuff works and it's a habit. These are the things that people are used to doing in order to meet their needs. I appreciate the empathy involved in identifying the why behind people engaging in junk behavior. Yeah. Other forms of communication have failed to convey what they were looking for. Yeah, this is the thing they knew to best meet their needs. It's the thing they knew to best meet their needs. Okay, so we have some empathy for why people are doing junk. We have a good idea of what it is. So what is not junk? That That's serious behavior. Things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And we should, of course, um, stop, interrupt these things. We need to respond to these. We have a tool called Stay Close Hot um, that is really helpful for um, behaviors ramping up into serious. There's other things that we can do. We can use a safety crisis plan if somebody has one. We can also use 988 um, if we're concerned about uh, safety. So we need to respond to serious behavior it requires another intervention. That is why it is helpful to categorize behaviors to help us determine what response we might use. Just uh, another quick set of examples here. So, um, you know, again, really thinking about who the person is. This mixing ingredients for a cake is significant for some people. For others, it might be just okay. Um, you know, saying thank you, same thing, might be just okay for some people, but it is significant for others. Um, Hitting, uh, taking off your clothes in public, uh, hitting your head on a hard surface, those things are serious. Junk, cursing, spitting, burping, the stuff we're spending a lot of time on. Okay. You guys seem to have a really good understanding. So let's talk about some more things that um, are helping guide um, the strategies that we're proposing for you. And these are the fundamental facts. So these are the things that go into the strategies that we're uh, teaching. The first one, the environment is responsible for the behavior. The behavior is right. It is based on that person's history, uh, based on um, their their previous learning, their their current physiology. That is the behavior they knew to best meet their needs. That behavior is always right. And we can make changes to the environment in order to change that behavior. So the behavior is always right. And again, I don't mean right like it was the right thing for Sally to punch Johnny. I mean, it was right as in it was the thing Sally knew to meet her needs in this moment. The other, the next fundamental fact we have is about consequences. So anything that happens after a behavior is a consequence. Anything that happens after a behavior is a consequence. So oftentimes we think about consequences kind of like behavior as that negative thing, right? But in fact, a consequence is anything and everything that happens after that behavior. And those consequences will either make that behavior stronger and more likely to happen in the future or happen at a greater intensity in the future, or they will make that behavior weaker, less likely to happen in the future, and or, or possibly just with, with less intensity in the future. And the only way we know uh, the, the type of consequence we provided is by what happens in the future. So either there happens more in the future and that consequence was reinforcing or the behavior happens less in the future and that consequence was a punishment. So we need to pay attention to um, what consequences are occurring and what happens to that behavior in the future. And that's how we know the impact of those consequences. The next fundamental fact is it takes time. <laughs> It takes so much time and, and what should we do? We should take data so that we know, so that we're able to identify changes as they occur. Um, we're gonna be patient and we're really going to be specific um, and consistent about what we're doing. So it's gonna take time, it's gonna take a lot of consistency um, and that means consistency across the environment, across caregivers, across um, people. The next one is really important. Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, all things being equal. This means that we can plan and be prepared. If I know that every time I talk to Johnny, he has a really hard time, I can be prepared. I can anticipate that and I can do things to prevent it. If I'm always the per if Johnny gets nervous when I come around because I'm only coming around when bad things are happening, well, I can go and do some stay closes and I can make our I can shift that engagement in our relationship. We can plan because we know that 
past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So we can plan. If you know that X happened last time, it's likely to happen again. What can we do to make things different? We can plan. The next one is that we know that giving negative, we're going to talk about coercion here in a minute, punitive consequences or creating a worsening for someone often creates more problems and it leads to more undesirable behavior. So we want to avoid providing negative, coercive, punishing consequences. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. Number six, in the long run, positive consequences. People respond better to positive consequences. So our goal is to shift our focus from thinking about behavior as a negative thing to thinking about all behaviors to start infusing the environment with positive consequences after desirable behavior occurs as often as possible. We want to start thinking about those just okay behaviors. We want to make that shift in the environment. And in the long run, behavioral behavior will respond to that positive shift in the environment. Okay, so these are these fundamental facts are gonna guide the rest of the content that we're talking about today. And so please keep them in mind. Again, I talked about this earlier when I set the stage about that triangle with the green, the yellow, and the red. This is all green stuff. This is that universal approach and it sets the foundations for all the other interventions that a person might need. So similar to this idea of behavior or consequences, the idea of discipline is another term that gets uh, pigeonholed into the negativity um, and, and around and people think about discipline as a punishment. In reality, discipline it means to teach. So math is a discipline, science is a discipline, English is a discipline. A discipline is something that you learn, it's something that you're taught. And so if we are using punishment as a discipline, what are we doing? We are teaching and modeling and motivating exactly what we don't want. So our goal is to focus our discipline on the skills we want to see and focus on those desirable behaviors. So your another thing about punishment is it's going to hurt your relationship. Um, and again, we're teaching and modeling and motivating exactly the behaviors that we don't want to see if we're using punishment as our discipline. So to effectively change behavior, we've got to teach and motivate the desirable behavior that we want to see. We've got to pay more attention to it. That's what we have to start spending more of our time on. And one of the ways that we can do this is by really identifying some target behaviors. So what are the things you want to see more of? What do you want to teach? What do you want to increase in the environment? Let's start teaching that stuff. Um, and we can also um, weaken and decrease the undesirable behavior by focusing on this desirable behavior, on the stuff that's going to replace it. You know, there's only so many hours in the day. So the more time we spend focused on that good desirable stuff, just the less time there is for the other things. So let's talk more about motivating desirable behaviors. We're going to minimize the emphasis on undesirable. So when I have to respond to an undesirable behavior, I'm going to do so without the emotion. I'm going to do so calmly um, and without any of that, that emotional baggage that can come with um, undesirable behaviors. I'm going to associate um, those desirable behaviors in the environment with big improvements. I'm really going to help con people connect um, you did this thing and here's what it means for you in the future. And then again, I'm really just going to uh, increase my emphasis on the desirable behavior. I'm going to look for those just okay behaviors in the environment and really start to shift the focus there. So focus on healthy, desirable behaviors and avoid that focus on inappropriate. It's going to take time. <laughs> Um, this is a slow change. Uh, it's, it's slow for everybody. You know, people have been, been engaging in the junk behavior for a really long time. And so that's part of this shift and why it's so difficult is that it's been happening for a long time. Same goes for our undesirable behavior. Same goes for, um, for the shift in focus. We've been focused on the undesirable stuff for a long time. It's, it's a shift in our focus. It's going to take time. So, um, you know, we're looking for improvement, not perfection. Um, that goes for ourselves as well as um, anyone we're trying to support. So let's talk about coercion. These are the things that we're doing that are hurting us right now. These are the things that are hurting our relationship. They are um, they are really common in our society. 
Um, none of these are planned reactions. I'm, I'm really trying to preface this because I'm about to like, um, well, we are about to, Catherine's gonna start talking about coercion and we, th this stuff is really hard. Um, this is how we were brought up. It's how we were, this house, you know, we were treated in school. It's how our parents responded to us. We are about to show you a bunch of examples of things we're doing that aren't helpful and you're gonna see yourself. We're all gonna see ourselves. I joke all the time that it's my goal in life to avoid coercion for a whole day. It's really hard. It is really hard. So I just wanna preface this with, this is difficult. We are all works in progress and you're about to, we're about to say, please avoid doing these things about things that you're doing. So this is, this is hard. Um, so coercion is a, is a way that we punish. Um, it's, um, it's a way we punish. It's the way we tell people that I don't like what you're doing and you need to stop. It's not a clear way. It's just one of the ways. Um, and it often involves like a put down or disrespect. Um, it can definitely hurt our relationships. And so our goal when we're teaching and, um, you know, in our discipline is to avoid using coercion as a method to change behavior. Um, so, you know, coercion is a way we punish. It's a way we try to tell people we don't like what you're doing and get them to stop. These are not planned reactions. They are habitual. We have all experienced these. Um, and I'm going to pass this off to Catherine with a list of 10 things we're all doing wrong <laughs> we're, we, that we're all going to avoid in the future. Man, what a positive way to start my time uh, presenting. So welcome. I'm Catherine and I'm going to tell you all the things that are going wrong. Um, but so here are the, like, we have things categorized, these, these coercions, we've kind of, people have outlined and figured out and categorized some of these ways that our interactions are coercive. And so our list here, um, let me get this set up a little bit. I'm going to talk more about each one of these, but here are the top, you know, the 10 um, that we kind of give as the most, most common, most visible. Um, let me adjust this okay so and we get these from um it's a book called the power of positive parenting um by dr glenn latham it's a great read um but they're these are taken from them and the categorizing it is a way to help us recognize um the habits that we have and they are habits uh like kathleen just said they're habits they're like just ingrained in us the way people happen to respond um there are definitely um Oh, I see in the chat. I'm going to try and keep up with the chat, but um, it's called The Power of Positive Parenting by Dr. Glenn Latham. Um, so these aren't the only ways. These are certainly not the only ways that coercion can um, occur in your environment. But, um, but these are, you know, the ones that are a bit more, most visible, most common. Um, okay. So our next slide here is going to talk more about them. Um, okay, so our first one up here is questioning. And like Kathleen said, you may recognize um, recognize that you do some of these. And uh, our goal is to just avoid coercion. The first step is recognize it and to try our best to navigate our day without doing these things. So questioning. Asking a question you really don't want answered. Um, so it... As an example of this, I always kind of think about a kid missing curfew. Like, do you know what time it is? You don't really want to know the answer to that. You just want to make them aware that you're you're frustrated with them. Um, so that's kind of what questioning looks like. Like, where were you? Again, it doesn't really matter. They missed curfew. That's what you're you're trying to make them aware that you're mad. Um, that's not going to help in the long run. Okay. So, and it creates a worsening for that person. That person hears the question and is, you know, automatically goes to defensive. We'll talk about the effects of coercion here in a minute. Okay, so arguing, our next one. So, um, there's lots of arguing. I mean, people argue co commonly and, you know, with a spouse or with a, with a child, we always say it takes two people to argue. Um, so challenging someone's point of view. Um, usually there's not ever a, a winner. And if you do win, you know, if you do win, you don't feel great about it anyway. Um, 
And so putting someone down or, or um, you know, disrespecting their point of view. Um, okay. Here, we'll go into our next one. So sarcasm and teasing. This one is a, it's a rough one because um, <laughs> I find myself quite a bit in that sarcasm and teasing, um, in joking, but it really takes, you know, it's at the expense of somebody. Sarcasm and teasing, at the end of the day, so, somebody is, you know, it's a worsening. Um, the statement is a worsening for a person. Um, it's often confusing, misunderstood. Sometimes, you know, in your interactions, sarcasm can be funny and you get it. But if you miss that joke and you're feeling, uh, it, it feels bad. You feel, you know, your automatic reaction is to be like, oh, why are they so mean to me? When they meant, that person meant it as sarcasm. Um, a lot of times this includes like that body language and tone of voice. We talk a lot about the body language, how much body language and tone of voice really conveys. Um, okay. Our next one, force. This one is a pretty rough one, that verbal physical aggression. Um, we all kind of can recognize what physical aggression is, certainly. But verbal aggression um, is also that use of force. Um, so, and that is <laughs> verbal aggression is that like that threatening, um, and it, it just, again, it makes it worse. That person that feel, does not feel good about that interaction that you have afterwards. Um, our next one here, let's see, threatening. Um, so you're, you're reminding and pointing out bad events that will follow. So, oh, you're gonna, you know, you're you're gonna miss your lunch if you do that. Like, that's pointing out the bad events that are gonna follow. That's kind of an example of our threatening. Um, it, it's that that warning, and sometimes people don't again realize that when they use the, that kind of language, that that is coercive. So it, they're trying to get across a point, but it again creates a worsening for that person. that criticism. Next up is our criticism. You don't like what someone is doing or how they're doing it. You're going to make sure that they know it. Um, and sometimes you might be trying to, to teach them how to do it better. So, I mean, this one's a tough one because you just, you know, you want to point it out and you want to tell them, um, you know, direct them to what's going wrong. Um, but that, you know, in that moment, they're just feeling that pain and your judgment. Uh, they're not feeling like it's a, an improvement. It's, again, creating that worsening. It implies that you don't respect their decision um, that, they, that they're making um, or their choices that they're making. Our next one here, we've got despair. That's just giving up. Like, oh, well, I guess we're never going to get to the store. Like, oh, we're never doing this activity again. Uh, you know, I'm never bringing you to the grocery store again. That kind of despair is like, it's never gonna work ever again. You're hopeless, you're you know stuck, and it's gonna be like this forever. Um, so that doesn't, again, it all comes back to that doesn't feel good to them. It's a, a worsening, um, but so many times you hear that in the store, you know, you might hear that in, in people's interaction in the store and it's, they don't mean it. They, they don't, it's just a reaction. Um, it's not actually, you know, the, what you're trying to get across. It's just your immediate reaction that, you know, that deep side of the, okay. Our next one, lecture logic. This is one I find myself in a lot. Um, so you already, someone's, you know, talking and you're already ready to jump in before they're even finishing their sentence. And you're going to tell them, you're going to tell them about it. You're going to tell them why it's wrong. You're going to tell them, um, you know, here's what we're going to do instead. And you just talk and talk and talk about it. Um, again, that's, you know, putting down, it's showing them disrespect that you don't care about what they were saying. You're just trying to get across your message. Uh, I, you know, fall into that talking too much. I'm going to over explain it to really make sure that they know that uh, this other person works, that, that, that this other person knows what I'm talking about. And um, 
or it's repeating something like in this example, repeating something the person already knows. Like, yeah, maybe they should have done, done it differently that at that time, but they probably are already aware of it. Oh. They don't need you pointing that out in the moment. That's not building your relationship. Our next one, taking away, um, you know, big ones that we see here are taking away the access to the phone or to TV or, you know, those kind of privileges, um, removing that from something that they get frequently. Um, and often it doesn't result in the person understanding that their behavior caused the removal. Um, often they look at it as, as something that you did to them. Um, you took away their phone. It wasn't because of the actions that they did. It, it's, you know, that mean mom took away my phone again. It wasn't because of their actions. It was because mom is mean. Um, so that taking away, that, that's taking away. Um, so we we go into this a little bit in our bigger tools of choice classes that um, that earning and don't don't and not earning we call it earn and not earn um, that consequence and so we go into that and talk about how um, it's that way the responsibility is on the individual as opposed to on us being the person to take away being you know that big bad mean person coming in and taking things away. Um, we, we can set up opportunities for a person to earn or not earn a privilege. Okay, another one. Oh, I see it. it. This one, this one hurts. It hurts when you see it happen. Talking bad about a person, talking about a person's bad behavior with that person sitting right there that they can hear you. Um, I think about it like a, a shift change or, you know, mom and dad when, you know, oh, when, when your father gets home from work or, you know, when he gets home, you wouldn't believe what Sally did today. She all day long, she and Sally's sitting right here. Um, it, it's embarrassing and, you know, disrespecting that show of disrespect like we have in our notes here. Um, it's a worsening for them. Um, and. Again, it's kind of just an automatic. It's things that you were that were modeled for you and your as you were growing up. Um, it, it's just an automatic. It's not um, something you thought through and planned out. Like I'm going to do this so it hurts that person. Um, it's just part of society, like Kathleen said earlier. Um, okay, so our effects of coercion. And I've kind of you know reference these a little bit earlier as well. Um, so I, so these effects, has it happened to you before? Have you noticed any of these coercions in your life? And what was your response? Did you want to, you know, our first one here, avoid. Did you want to spend more time with that person when you know, after that coercive event? Um, did you want to be like, oh yeah, let's hang out. I'm going to continue that interaction. Um, when they came around again, you're probably going to maybe avoid that interaction. You're going to, if you see them walking down the hallway and you know they're going to lecture and logic you about something you did, an email you sent, or an interaction you had, you're probably going to, you know, make a quick right turn and veer into the bathroom. Um, get even. You're going to, uh, get getting even is just that, um, oh, they did it to me. I'm going to do it back to them. I'm going to make them not feel good. So that's the get even the escape is the I'm going to get up. I'm going to leave this right now. I'm, I can't deal with this situation anymore. I'm going to leave. That's what happens in um, when there's a coercive inter interaction. If I'm feeling that coercive interaction, I don't want to stick in it anymore. I'm not going to sit there and listen to it. I just want to get out of there as fast as I can. That's escape. Um, and also it, people learn that coercive behavior. They learn the things that you're modeling. Um, they're going to behave less confidently in the future because they know that you're, they're just going to get coercive back at them. They're going to get questioned or they're going to get lecture on logic or threatened. So then they're just going to, they're waiting for your coercive response and um, kind of, you know, expecting to have co coercive events happen to them. Um, so then another one is they're getting attention for that undesirable behavior. If it's, you know, especially that talking bad about their behavior, they're getting attention for that undesirable behavior. Um, so all of these things are ways that people respond to a course of event. Um, our top three we have there highlighted, the avoid, get, even, escape. Those are like the most common, but 
by being coercive, we show people, we, we're modeling that coercive event. Um, and like Kathleen said, we want to focus on the desirable, those things that we're trying to teach and increase in our life um, and to put all of our attention on those, you know, those desirables as opposed to the coercives and negatives. Um, okay, so when does this usually happen? Um, when, when do you find yourself most coercive? Um, it, it's usually, again, an an automatic response. It's not that planned interaction that you have. It's an automatic um, and it, that thing pops out of your mouth. Um, when you're hungry or tired, you know, that hangry, very real, um, very real for you to jump into a snap judgment. And um, when you're feeling uncomfortable, when you're having a bad day, um, when you're frustrated, um, every, everyone does this. Everyone has these moments, you know, everyone's probably probably was tired this morning or the end of your work day. It's probably a time where you're tired and hungry um, and those things just pop out. Um, one of our other examples that we are typically coercive when we encounter our pet peeves, some of those junk behaviors, we're gonna talk about a skill that we have for that later. Um, so knowing these and kind of keeping that in your mind's eye is helpful to recognize when you're going to most likely be coercive um, and when you're at risk for doing those actions and help, can help you plan and um, practice for other ways to respond when you are hungry or tired or, you know, feeling that, um, feeling that trigger for yourself. Um, okay. So coercive, people do coercive actions, the, these coercions, because it works in the short term, unfortunately, um, but it only creates those longer term problems, those responses to coercion. Um, they're going to be, that individual is going to learn coercion and do those coercive acts as well. Um, it works short term because they're avoiding you. They're avoiding that coercive interaction, but it doesn't fix our problem. It doesn't fix the frustrations or, you know, that behavior that's driving you up a wall, that drunk behavior. Um, it's those long-term um, problems. But that's why people do coercion, because in the instant, it works, unfortunately. So, we're, so if we're, our goal is to avoid coercion, um, what should we do instead? What are we going to do here instead of doing the, those coercions and worsening our relationships? We're gonna make a plan. The slide is, is perfect about making a plan. Here are some steps, here are some things we can do. Um, so what, what happened? What situation happened that triggered the undesirable behaviors? Thank you, thank you about those behaviors that are happening in the env in environment. And we talked about the definition of behaviors, anything that can be seen and counted. Um, what payoff is, the person getting from doing those undesirable behaviors? Are they getting the, that attention? Are they getting your responses? Um, or are they getting out of, you know, are they able to get out of that activity then because um, they, because you just shut it down and, you know, use that um, despair maybe. Um, so they get out of it. So when that bad or worsening situation occurs in similar situations, um, does that person sometimes do the desirable behavior? What, and we can focus here, number four is my favorite. What does this person need to, to learn to do? What can we teach them? Um, what, th this question kind of gets to the heart of the whole thing. What can we focus on? What's stopping them from, you know, having those desirable behaviors? Um, what needs to change in the environment to pre prevent these undesirable behaviors and promote desirable behaviors? Um, is it our responses? Is that the only thing? Or is it a skill that maybe they, they need to work on and we can help teach them? Again, using these like those positives and focusing on what can we do as opposed to the negatives, what's going wrong? What can we do? Here's the key though, here's what it comes down to. What can we do? We can build our relationship with that person. We have our tool that we're gonna go into, building our relationship and building that foundation um, with that other person is really gonna help those, you know, coercive 
responses go away and that that person feels supported and ready to um, ready to work on those skills together building a relationship that's that's the foundation of it all so here are our steps to building a relationship we call, we do we call this our stay close steps um, so moving towards that person remaining within arm's reach so showing them it's not hollering across the break room or across like a cafeteria. You're moving closer to them, showing them that it's you and them. You're you're having an interaction, um, touching if appropriate to the situation, um, using that high five or that like you know a pat on their shoulder, that kind of that closeness to show that you you're there, you you care. Our next step: the caring facial expression and our tone of voice. And that go, really goes together with the relaxed body language. But our body language, our facial expressions, how much this, how much weight that carries, it's it's crazy. That the message gets across. Um, kind of like with one of our questioning examples, you could ask saying the same thing with different tone of voice and different um, expressions. So the oh, do you know what time it is? Versus do you know what time it is? I said the exact same thing, exact same words. We all know the message I was trying to send in both of them. Um, so that facial expression, um, really making sure that your facial expressions are in tune, um, that your tone of voice is caring, that you genuinely seem interested. Um, Cause again, if you're over there distracted or like closed off and like, yeah, well, like you can tell when there's a distance when you're trying to interact with somebody. So open and warm. So, and it's important to do this, like this says, within 15 seconds of the start of this stay close, like right away, you're ready to go. Um, ready to go, ready to show that you are here, you're warm, you're ready. Um, asking open-ended questions. So the, these are our few key steps here that we really like to stick to. Um, is six, seven, and eight. Open-ended questions. The point of open-ended questions is getting that conversation flowing. Um, what What did you do today? Or the, those what's or how's or, you know, how did you do that? Those kind of things. Again, how did you do that is way different than how did you do that? You know, that, that judgment, that weight that our body language is carrying, but asking those open-ended questions, the goal, getting them talking, getting that interaction rolling, getting them talking about something. Um, and it might take a couple open-ended questions because if that person is, you know, not in a great mood or not ready, didn't know that you're ready to have an interaction, they might shut it down. So just keep trying, get that conversation rolling. Our empathy statements. We'll we'll do lots of practice and talking about our empathy statements, but it's saying something. It's recognizing the other person is having an emotion. They're having an emotion, and you see that. Um, seeing how the situation that they're in makes them feel. Our encouragement, acknowledging that the person has done something and how that's going to improve their situation in the future. So encouragement is how is that going to, what does that mean for them in the future? You worked really hard and it's going to pay off. You're going to be able to get that job. You're going to get that promotion. Recognizing that they've done something and they worked hard or, you know, done something that's going to pay off for them big in the future. So then our other keys here, listen while they're speaking, genuinely listen. You get that, you use your open-ended questions and get them talking and you listen. You talk less, let them talk. The point of that, the building that relationship, letting them talk and get their message across and talk about the, the thing that they're talking about. You're not down here, don't interrupt or abruptly change the topic. Stay with them. Um, avoid reacting to some of those junk behaviors, those ones that are you know driving us up the wall um, and avoiding our coercive responses. Wow. So these aren't always in the same order, but like you can you can see that uh, caring facial expression, tone of voice, um, body language. That's important to do throughout the, throughout all of it. Um, sometimes you might need to do empathy and then open ended questions. But the underlying steps here, those those six and seven, are going to be or six, seven, and eight um, are going to be are most likely to change in the sequence. But and they're the most important practice to practice because we, we have to practice those. Uh, 
Okay, so empathy is being able to take the perspective of another per person and communicate to that person. That doesn't mean you necessarily agree or have been in that situation before, but you can see that, um, you know, that something sucks or that it's exciting. You can see that in them and you recognize that. And just saying those words, I can tell you seem frustrated, you seem excited, you seem thrilled recognizing that they're that what they're feeling is important um, and giving them that you know giving that to them so it, it's like your emotions what you're experiencing matters to me and it goes back to that key you're building that relationship um so the empathy it doesn't mean that you you approve that you necessarily even agree uh, if they broke their favorite cup and they're just devastated about it, even though there's more in the cabinet and it's not a problem, like, but to them, it's the worst day. It's the worst thing. And you, you can say, oh, you must be devastated. You, you just, you're, you must have a broken heart about this. Um, recognizing that it's, it's not good for them or that it is, or something else that it's awesome for them. Maybe they found a penny and they have a, you know, they're collecting them and it's a cool year for them. That may not be something that you care about. That may not be something you don't have a penny collection at home, but you can see that this is a big deal to them and recognizing that. Um, that's what our empathy is about. It takes practice, but sticking to those keys of you seem, you seem excited, you seem scared, you seem nervous, anxious, just any one of our emotion words and relating that to them. So our encouragement, our other another step here of our stay close, building our relationship steps is encouragement. Being able to communicate and show how that person's behavior has improved their situation, something that they did is gonna pay off for them. It's made a, their, their situation, their day, their, you know, maybe it's their school year or maybe it's their, you know, their soccer season or their career. Um, it's improved their situation. Um, that say so say something to let the person know you can, you believe you can behave or can behave again to create more improvements that this is only like a jumping off point like you worked hard you studied for that test you're going to get a great get grade you're you might be able to you know ace this class now um, you might need to um you might need to ask more open-ended questions to learn more about, you know, learn more about the situation and what's going on, but that, that you're able to see that this is something that they've worked hard for and is gonna, you know, gonna have a payoff. It's important that they are going to be able to do this skill again, and it's exciting. Um, so that's the encouragement. Okay, so here's our, our we're going to do some practice here. So we're going to navigate find our chat box again. Um, so we, we've got our scenario. Awesome Alex here. Alex just got his GED results back. He passed. He'd studied for this thing. He's prepared. He's studied. He's you know done flashcards, everything. Um, you're walking down the hall and he's walking towards you and he rushes over to you to show you his score. Um, what kind of empathy, what kind of emotion is he, what kind of empathy could we give him? What emotion do you recognize in them? I'm going to give give everyone a time or two to a minute or here to um, fill in some chats. But yeah, we've got so many. I love. It. Thank you, everyone, for responding in the, this chat. This makes us way better of a presentation. This, um, yeah, excitement. I'm seeing a lot of excitement and proud pride and. Um, he, He's definitely proud. He's ready to show you his 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 score results. Um, you look ecstatic, excited. Um, awesome job, you guys. You guys are really recognizing um, the emotion that he's feeling. He's feeling some kind of way, and we're going to tell him that we see him. Uh, you look so proud. You seem excited. You seem pumped. You seem thrilled. Um, what kind of um, 
What does it mean for him in his future? Let's practice our encouragement statements. What does it mean for Alex in the future for him? What kind of encouragement statement can we give him? Go ahead and put that in the chat box too. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of that. Your hard work paid off. Um, and Tiffany put in there, you can get that job you wanted. Um, you can, yeah. This, what does this GED result mean for him in the future? Like, you can do anything. You can accomplish. You worked hard, and you can get that job. You, there, you know, you can go on that. You can go on that trip. You can, um, all of these things. Uh, Oh yeah, I'm seeing some uh, some open-ended questions in there. Awesome job. Um, yeah. So what is this? What does this really really mean for him in the future? You studied hard, and it really paid off. That's what we were wanting to recognize for him in the future. Um, you worked hard, and it paid off. You 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 did it. Awesome job, guys. Thank you for all the, for the practice. Um, it takes it takes work to practice, but again, with Alex here, we can see that excitement. We can see our our empathy statement to give to him. You guys, you guys nailed it. Um, we can see that emotion for him. And then also this one, it's easy to see. He he passed his test. He's got that GED. Now he can go get on go on and get a job. Uh, it's so exciting. Okay, we're gonna do it again with just okay, Justin. So this one takes a little bit more. Let's think about it. Um, and we're going to practice some of our, our empathy, empathy statements and our encouragement statements. So the scenario is, um, you know, you're eating in the break room. Justin's sitting there in the break room. And he, Justin moves some papers, uh, moves some papers out of the way um, to let a peer sit down. And to let, some, you know, make room for someone there at the table. And Justin smiles and says hi to you when he sees you. What? What emotion can we see in Justin? What kind of empathy can we give to him to tell him that we see how we how he feels? This one's a little trickier. Feel free to just throw it in that chat box. Um, how can we see how we how he feels? So he's moving papers, making room for somebody else to sit down in a break room. Uh, he must feel like he's in a good mood. Yeah, he must feel like he's maybe he's relaxed. He's in a break room, taking a break from his uh, taking a break from his work, his work or his job. Um, he's relaxed. He's feeling um, kind. Um, He's feeling welcoming. He's ready for a friend, anticipating that social reaction. Yeah, he's, you know, you, you look like you might need a friend. Um, you look relaxed. You seem, uh, you seem chill. So, some emotion that he's having. Um, okay, so there, there's our emotion. Like I said, it was a little trickier than, you know, that big um, Alex there getting his GED results. It's a little trickier, but just because it's less, you know, obvious and in your face doesn't mean that Justin's not having emotions here. He moved papers. He he did an action to show, to sh you know, to communicate something. Um, okay. So what kind of what kind of encouragement can we give him? What kind of encouragement to really show us um, what does that mean for him in the future? Again, a little trickier, but I know you guys can do it. Put it. Go ahead and put it in the chat box. What things can we recognize? What actions can we recognize that Justin completed? What did Justin do that's going to make an impact for him in the future? There we go. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, he, so that action that he's doing, he's making room. He's making room at the table, and it's going to, like, 
and you move papers that recognizing the action, you move those papers. And now I'm, you know, anyone can come and sit down next to you, or I'm going to sit next to you every day. If you make, if you make room for me, I'd, I'd sit next to you anytime. Um, yeah, we've got here, like Jessica said, having lunch again in the future. Um, I recognize that he's moving those papers. So he's willing and ready to, um, make room. Maybe he didn't know that before. Um, but when you move those papers, that makes room for me to sit and I'm going to, you know, anyone's going to be wanting to sit with you in the future. Um, and it's going to be a way to, um, help make friends. You move those papers and you're ready to, you know, you're ready to have interactions and make some friends here in this break room. I'm trying to scroll through these chat boxes. You'll make lots of friends if you keep being kind and moving your papers. Absolutely, Angie. Oh. All right, so we got we got some practice in again. It's recognizing, recognizing that they're having an emotion and what those actions did for them in the future. That's the key. What those actions are and how they're gonna affect them in a positive way in the future. All right, so what else can we do? Um, we've got pivot around some of those junk behaviors. Um, we're gonna talk more about our, our pivot skill. And it's those junk behaviors, they're not illegal, not harmful, but uh, they're not necessarily, like Kathleen talked about, they're not necessarily those ones that uh, we're gonna work on teaching and increasing. So how does the, do those junk behaviors how, do, how does performing those drunk behaviors pay off for them? What are they getting out of that at doing those behaviors? They're getting the attention. Um, they're, maybe it makes you go away. If, you're, if you see that drunk behavior, maybe it, they're wanting you to go away. And so they're going to do that, that thing. They're going to do that thing to get you to go away. Or because they know that you're going to jump in and give them a big reaction. Um, to see you have any sort of reaction, a big, a big reaction here. That's, to see you angry, shocked, hurt, afraid. Um, to see you react, um, or maybe they're looking for that comfort, or to to give in um, and just you know use those coercives, and um, you're going to get into that um, despair maybe, and just fine, take it and go away. Um, to get you to do something for them, they they don't. It's a delaying tap tactic. They get out of they get out of doing something for a little bit. Maybe they don't have to do their chores if they keep, you know, asking questions and repeating the same question, repeating that same question. You engage with them and have a conversation for 15 more minutes and you know, lecture and logic or you know, back and forth with them about about something, they get out of it. So that drunk behavior is paying off for them. Not necessarily in the way that we imagine, but it's paying off. They're getting they're getting a reaction. So often, so our episodes of serious behavior start. It starts with that little junk behavior and escalate as people react to it. Um, so this it's a it's a reaction to coercion. Um, they're going to get even. It's how things are going to just escalate and continue to rise as they, as you, you know, pay it off and pay it off and it works up and up and up. Um, so it might, so responding to junk behavior and the junk, it's going to pay off more for them and they're going to do it more and more in the future. Like, oh, that worked for me. I got out of, I got out of having to do that chore. I got out of that assignment if I, you know, pestered or if I, you know, asked a million questions or if I whined about it, that's a big one. If I whined about it, um, I got out of it and um, we're not purposely coercive, but it happened and it paid them off. Uh, so that frequency of the junk behavior is probably going to increase because it, they got paid off and it worked. So here's how to pivot. Here's how to, you know, pivot around some of these junk behaviors that are annoying and frustrating to us. Um, so that's what our, uh, again, that's what our junk behavior is. It's annoying, uh, not harmful, but not something that we're increasing. 
So here's our steps. We don't react to the drunk behavior with that tone of voice, facial expressions, like I talked about in our stay closes and our building our relationships. Don't let anything on your face that, you know, those smirks or those like, you know, you're really trying to keep it cool, like, or rolling your eyes or heavy sighing, any of that, those, those nonverbals of body language, that's also giving it attention. Um, people recognize when you're rolling your eyes or heavy sighing at them at, at something that's happening. Um, so we're not reacting with any of the those nonverbals. And you we're going to choose one of our, our three pivot options here. Our three pivot choices are subtly, subtly pivot to another person, somebody else in the room that's close by, um, or to an activity. Maybe it's back to your uh, back to your paperwork, or maybe it's back to your shoe you're tying. Just suddenly go to something else for a moment. Um, actively attend to another activity or pivot on the person. Just continue that interaction and just don't react to it. And so we use that a lot, like picking, if somebody's picking their nose, you're having a conversation with them and they're just really getting into it and you're over here, you want to like, it's gross to you. Like you can't, ugh. but again, that like, if you're gagging, that making those reactions, we're going to just pretend, we're going to shut it off in our brain. We're going to pretend like they're not doing it. We're going to power through. That's what our pivot on the person skill is going to do. Um, and actively attend to that person, that just okay behavior, something else that they're doing. They're having a conversation with you. So you're going to actively attend to that conversation. Um, that's what our pivot on the person is. Um, so we're subtly, I'm going to give some more examples. I should probably do that for subtly pivot to another person. Our example A here, subtly pivot to another person, actively attend to another person. So if you're in a classroom and uh, that person, your Johnny's over there and he's, you know, daydreaming and tapping his tapping the table and, you know, off in left field. But uh, but uh, John over there is he's working on his paper. He's writing down, he's taking notes. Uh, so we're going to actively attend to them. And the second, the second here um, that they that our problem that junk behavior resolves a little bit, maybe Johnny. Maybe maybe our person picks up their pen. You can give you can pivot back to them. You always have to come back um, after drunk behavior stopped. Provide reinforcement for the desirable or just behavior, just okay behavior. Um, praise um, provide that reinforcement for that person who is doing that drunk behavior. They pick up that pen again. That's something that you can uh, that you can recognize and you come back to them. Um, a pivot to an activity. Maybe it's um, you're gonna, you know, organize or reorganize or you know, straighten the papers that are in your hand if you if you're passing out papers and they're you know off task. But then again, the second they start to get back to back to task, you provide that praise. You provide that attention for um, for the desirable or just okay behavior. You're gonna repeat that as much as 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 much as you need to. Um, Maybe that drunk behavior, again, this isn't going to wipe out this drunk behavior. They're never going to do that junk behavior again, but it's in that moment to stop you from reacting and paying off that junk behavior. We're going to stay cool. We're going to avoid using the, those coercives. Um, th so those are our steps here. Uh, that's, that's how we're going to pivot. We're going to practice. We're going to talk more about pivot here. So why don't you just ignore it? Why, why, why aren't we ignoring it? So our problems with ignoring that behavior and just, you know, walking away completely, leaving the room, ignoring that person, ignoring that behavior. What's the problem with it? That's pretty coercive. That it could be reinforcing that you left. Um, it doesn't make that person feel good. It's kind of a worsening that you are, you're just not, you know, not ever going to pay attention to them. And, and like we talked about earlier, it could cause a behavior burst. It can cause that escalation, um, that big old behavior. It can escalate up, up into more serious things. Um, so that's why it's so important for pivot when we're pivoting to another person or pivoting on an activity that we always come back to our, our person. We always come back to them. Uh, okay. So our advantage is it can in increase those desirable behaviors. It focuses on the positive. It teaches our individuals what we want them to do, what we're seeing that's a positive, those things that we're, we're teaching. 
um, and it's increasing those just okay behaviors. Um, it's preventing that be those behavior bursts where they are just, um, you know, okay, well, you're ignoring me. I'm going to, you know, escalate this and make my, you know, make it a big old reaction, make it a big old spectacle. So you maybe finally pay attention to me. Um, so we're prevent we're working on preventing those big old behavior bursts. We come back to them. It, it prevents it from becoming those serious or harmful behaviors. If you're going to ignore me when I do this, what happens when I bring it up to here? Are you going to ignore me when I'm doing something serious and dangerous? Probably not. We have to, you know, because we don't want to cause that harm. So we really want to make sure we're increasing those desirables, paying off those, those desirable behaviors that we see that we want to increase. All right, back to some more practice scenarios. So our... Um, I've talked about earlier that picking picking your nose that's a good a junk behavior that a lot of people ha have a problem with it's kind of it's pretty gross it's fair um so addie's frequently picking your nose and she is telling you about this cool package she got in the mail um but she's she's really digging into it you're in the middle of typing an email so that's the scenario you're you're typing away on your computer abby comes in picking her nose and telling you about this package what um what are we going to do? How are we going to um, pivot? What kind of things can we do here? If we're uh, pivoting on a person, if we're pivoting on her, we're going to just, you know, pretend that we're just going to shut that off and ignore, just not pay attention. Again, don't get, catch yourself with that ignore. It's it's a hard word to get used to. We're going to pretend like she is not picking her nose and carry on as usual. Um, so. When are you going to jump back in if you're pivoting on to another person or to an activity? So I, let's imagine she's doing that. I turn to my emails. I'm you know pivoting on an activity, turn to my email, still kind of keep typing. When am I going to ask her a question? When am I going to engage more and bring that interaction back? Put Go ahead and put in the chat box. When do you think I'm going to come back in and jump in with my engagement? Yeah, okay. We've got a couple people here on the right page. Return to Addie when she's removed her finger from her nose. Yeah, absolutely. When she stops picking her nose, that's when we're going to turn back to her. We're going to, you know, stop our emails and really be like, oh, man, what package did you get? What'd you get in that package? We can, you know, engage in that conversation yeah, when that behavior stops, when that junk behavior that's um, annoying and not, not great. Um, we're, when that behavior stops is when we come back and really engage in that conversation. Okay. You guys, you guys seem to have gotten that one. That's awesome. I'm proud of you guys. What about one more practice situation here? Our scenario two, outburst Ollie. So at the table, we've got two people, are Oliver and Sally. They're working on a project. Oliver's over there muttering things. This is stupid. I'm. It's dumb. I'm going to tear this up. And, you know, all those sorts of frustrating junk behavior. Sally's over there working on humming her favorite song. What kind of things? Um, what kind of things are we going to do? And when we pivot, this to me looks like a perfect example to pivot to another person. Pivot on another person. I'm going to, you know, I'll, Oliver Ollie there is doing our junk behavior. I'm not going to pay that off. I'm going to turn to Sally. I'm going to pivot on a person or pivot on another person and turn to Sally. Um, I'm going to talk about that song she's humming or the project. When am I going to turn back to Ali and engage him? All right, let's see. We've got here in the chat box. Oh, we've got a couple. Um, yeah, when he stops muttering, or um, we can ask Sally what tune she's humming. Um, pivot back when he quits mu uh, muttering and resumes working on the project. When he shows any sort of indication that he's directing his uh, directing his things, um, when he's directing his you know behavior 
down the right path that sometimes we have to take the littlest, you know, we're not going to wait till he's written two paragraphs and, you know, finished a report. We're going to, the littlest thing that we can give to him that we want to teach him, that we want to pay off. He's picked up his pen. He started reading the directions. He, you know, stopped muttering and looked at his paper. What can we pay off for him? That's when we're going to turn. And we, when we see any of that, we want to give him that. Um, once he shows positive interest, um, stops complaining. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna turn our attention to Sally and tell that kind of stuff, and then we come back to Ollie. Awesome, you guys, you guys got it. Okay, so that's that's our pivot skill. We've got another um, a scenario three here. Our meltdown, Malcolm. We're gonna practice again. So it's it's a little harder. Meltdown, Malcolm. You let Malcolm know it's time to go inside. He's screaming at you. This is bull crap. I do what I want. I don't want to do that. Any of those sort of, you know, he's he is not happy. Um, the other things that you can hear going around in your environment, you can hear music playing, the weather is nice, a bird is chirping. Those are kind of the other things that are going on in the environment. When are you going to get, get Malcolm? When are you going to turn back to him? Yeah, it's it's a it's a hard one, and I feel like a lot of people have probably been there. Um, you you guys hopefully are recognizing some of these scenarios where it's frustrating. You know, he's going to do this. You know, he's done this before. Maybe the word, he's screaming at you. It's not fun. It's not a fun situation to be in when he's screaming at you, and it's junk behavior. Um, there we go. Yeah, we have some when he stops screaming. Um, when the undesirable behavior stops or lessens, yeah, or lessens, that's a good good reminder that, again, he's probably, it's going to take a minute for him to, like, walk in and, and, and go inside and be inside. We don't want to wait till he's inside to provide any sort of that, that interaction. Um, we're going to do that when he shows any instance, if he takes a step towards the door, um, when that's, you know, the behavior lessening. If he's, you know, bringing it back down a little bit, that's that's when we jump in and provide that um, provide that interaction. It's really tricky, and it might take it take some time. And again, we can't ignore it, so um, we can't we can't just walk away from him. That's not safe. Um, but we want to make sure we're providing and checking back in with him. And we might have to do this a couple times. Again, like it's not that it's not always going to work the first time. They're they're probably you know. Um, our, our Ollie there is going to, you know, maybe he goes back to complaining after a little bit. We pivot again. We practice our other pivot skills. Maybe this time we pivot on another person or on the activity. Um, we find something else. We pivot to if we're outside, we hear the music playing. You know, we turn to look at the bird that's eat, eat, eating bird seed next to you. Um, and then we come back. It may take a couple times. Um, yeah, I'm seeing if, what if Malcolm doesn't stop? We come back to him. We, you know, we're providing, uh, we're not ignoring him until it completely stops. We circle back. We, you know, we recognize that in him. Um, those, um, we don't wait for it to completely end. We don't, it, waiting for it to completely end is not, um, not it doesn't work, you know, sometimes it doesn't completely end, but it's it's a way for you to not pay off that desirable behavior. We're not we're working on not paying off that desirable behavior. Um, so we come back to him, we talk about it's frustrating and we pivot again and we tie our shoes and we pivot and we come back to, oh, I see you took a step forward. Um, providing something that we see any sort of positives that we can recognize. And sometimes it's hard to recognize the positive that he's doing, um, but it takes time and practice. So what can we do? What else can we do? Stay close hot. It's a lot like our stay close skills we practiced earlier, the building those relationships. Um, here's how we stay close hot. It's a hot scenario. Um, we, we're not reacting to that junk behavior. We're staying calm, caring, keeping our tone of voice, relaxed body language. Um, 
usually, if we can, we're moving, you know, still moving and remaining close to them. Um, again, touch as appropriate to the situation. Asking those open ended questions that listening while they're speaking. Um, use the validation empathy. Those are these are all the skills that we can do when it's a hot situation. It's a hot situation for Malcolm to come inside. Um, we provide that empathy. It's frustrating. It's hard. It's not fun. Those kind of those kind of empathy statements are ones we could give. Um, use our encouragement statements and repeat until they're ready for the next step. Um, until they're ready for the next step, which is directing to an alternative behavior or a calming situation um, or assisting with a problem behavior um, and using that reinforcement after it's de-escalated um, and directing towards that um, enticing safer behavior. But we're going to wait. Um, we're going to wait, repeat above and repeat above. Sometimes it takes takes some time for that person who's escalated, who's in a, having a hot moment, for them to come back down. We're gonna have to recognize those emotions, recognize a couple of times, provide that empathy, um, and provide those the listening and validation and encouragement statements. Recognizing that it's a hard, you know, something that they did is paying, gonna pay off for them in the future. Um, So, and the saying, recognizing what if the client lacks emotion or empathy? So, if they're having a hot moment, you're seeing that they're frustrated. Um, and again, it's about them, it's about the moment that they're in. So, it's about recognizing you're frustrated, you're mad, you're sad, um, kind of like our, um, our other stay close skills before you're excited, recognizing, you know, what's going on in that person's world. So, again, sometimes it takes practice, sometimes it, it takes a couple, like, you you can be like, oh, you're frustrated. And sometimes it might not hit the nail on the head and they're going to tell you like, oh, man, you seem upset. And they're like, I'm more than upset. I'm really, really stinking mad at this. I'm so frustrated. I'm so mad. I am, you know, anything. They're going to tell you. Um, like, oh, you seem bummed out. They're like, I'm more than bummed out. I, I'm heartbroken. I am crushed. Like, so recognizing that I'm, um, emotion and recognizing that in them is our empathy statements. Um, it's really those empathy, those encouragement, um, those are really going to help repeat and repeat and repeat until they're ready. You know, I can see that you've worked hard and I'm so glad that you're talking with me about this. Um, it's really going to help us. Uh, it's really going to help you. You've worked so hard for it in the last time and now it's paying off for you this time. You've worked hard. Those kind of encouragements. Okay, so empathy, being able to take the perspective of another person. You know, we talked about our empathy a little before. Um, so identifying those emotions, that points of view. Um, you're letting go of your personal, you know, especially if it's a hot, you're letting go of that personal, like it's drunk behavior, it's frustrating, it's annoying to you, but they are sad. They are having an emotion. Okay, here's our practice. Our sad Sammy here. Sam has just had an argument with her roommate. Um, and she frequently lay, lays in bed and hours for hours and crying when she's upset. She's laying in bed crying and screaming that she needs a pill. She needs that med. She needs a pill. You're in the living room. How can we practice our, our building relationships still, our stay closes? Um, and what are we going to do here? We're going to, our first steps, for, if, we, if you remember here, um, our first steps are those, oh, let me pull those up. It's it's the moving within arm's reach. So you're not gonna handle this from the living room. You know, that's that's how our um, moving within arm's reach pays off. But you're not gonna holler down the hall, like that's not building your relationship. It's not gonna be improvement. <laughs> there we go. So we're not gonna react. We're gonna um, move within the arm's reach. So go in there. Um, Back to Sam. Okay, so how can we provide an empathy statement? What's Sammy feeling here? What can we tell Sammy that we recognize Sam's emotions? Okay. 
and you can go ahead and put that in the chat box. Sorry, I could have I could have said that earlier. Go ahead and put that in the chat box of what how can we use our empathy skill here? Mm -hmm. Our skill of recognizing the feelings that Sammy had. Yeah, that you seem upset. Um, and we were, I'm seeing some throwing in some of those open-ended questions too. What's going on? Um, sometimes, sometimes we might know in this situation um, what's what's happened or not. We can, but we can ask those open-ended questions. Get them talking about what's going on. Um, yeah, hey friend, it looks like you're very upset. Making sure you know, keeping that tone of voice in check, keeping that tone of voice there. You look really upset. Um, show empathy. Ask our open-ended questions. What kind of encouragement? Could we give there? There, so we've we've gone in, we've gone close to Sammy. Maybe we, you know, rubbed her shoulder a little bit, um, and we said, "You seem upset. You know, what's going on, Sammy? You seem upset. You seem frustrated. You seem sad. Um, what kind of encouragement can we give? We're talking about this. Um, what what encouragement? What thing? What behavior can we see in them that's positive?" It's tricky. It's hard. Um, yeah, we've worked on some of those skills that she's worked on before. Um, it, she went to her room for some privacy. Um, you know, maybe in the past, uh, Sammy has, you know, done some other undesirable behaviors, but this is a positive. She goes to lay in bed when she's upset and she goes to her room. Um, she's working on those coping skills, something that we can do that we can uh, recognize she's talking to you. Sammy, thank you for talking to me. Uh, it's really going to help us. And, um, you know, next time, uh, next time we're feeling this way, you've done this before, you know, you can talk to me and we can talk this out. But finding something that they that some behavior, that's a, a good one that they're talking to me and paying that off and recognizing that they've done the work and how it's going to work for them in the future. You're talking to me now, and I, I know next time this happens, you're going to be ready to talk to me and we can help talk this out together. Um, thank you for using your voice. Yeah, letting me know, letting me know what's going on. That's something that we can pay out. Um, yeah, that, she, that she's using some of those coping skills. So, so we've come in, we've started that interaction with her that empathy and she's telling us about that um, so that junk behavior so i'm glad none of you said oh we're gonna we're gonna come in there and say stop screaming take a pill <laughs> that's not what we're doing you guys are recognizing that we're going to give some of that empathy we're going to say you seem sad ask an open question what's going on um, and we're going to provide some encouragement We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna pay off that she is talking to us, that she is working on her coping skills of calming down, and taking a breath and talking it out with me. That's awesome. That's something. That's a great thing. That's gonna pay her off in the future. Um, if we remember back to our GED example, it's a great skill. They've studied hard. It's gonna pay off for them in the future. She's talking to you about this. What's going on for her? It's gonna pay off for her, her in the future. We're gonna be able to do this in the future, and it's gonna be great. It's going to help us work through our problems so much easier and breezier. Something that we can pay off. Thanks everyone for practicing those. I know those some of those skills, especially the, these pivot and the jump behavior and the, uh, the hot situations are kind of hard because we have someone in the back of our mind. We're thinking about a scenario and how this is going to work out. Um, and so this practice, it takes practice. It takes practice here and practice, you know, at, at your house and in your in your environments. Um, Okay. So that was um, that was that was our the bulk of our information. I'm so thankful for all of you for sticking with me with that with Kathleen and I. I hope you guys you know you guys really joined us. You guys were amazing at participating. This is just you know scratching the surface. This is a tidbit of what um, our full tools of choice class is. If you're interested, reach out to us. Um, we have our podcast here. If you get out your phone, use our um, our scanning here, your smartphone, scan this. This is going to take us to our 10 Common Coercions podcasts. So our, um, you know, our Director of Tiered Supports has some recordings done for us 
about those common coercions and giving examples. And it's really interesting. And it's, I've listened to them several times. You can, you always learn more information about our podcast. So if you get out your phone and scan, that'll take you right to that. Um, that's where you can, a place you can go for more information. Um, another option here, attend one of our full tools of choice classes uh, where we really work on interaction and practicing it and working out some of our, you know, but what ifs, what about this, what about that? We ask for even more participation and practice and role plays. So here's our, um, go ahead and scan this. Um, I, you know, go ahead and scan this and you will have any sort of our positive support consultants are going to be teaching these classes and really working with you together. Thank you, Kathleen, for our, we've got our a link for the 10 Common Coercion podcasts in there. Um, we've got our Tools of Choice class. You can sign up for those. We have several sessions in a month, um, one on pretty much every day of the week. We've, we're running our Tools of Choice classes, and we would love to have you there. Um, and we've got family coaching workshops that practice some of those skills. Those are typically, and we have those in the evenings usually, and they're, you know, taking away little snippets. Um, I think I'm catching up. Kathleen has our tools of choice registration, our family coaching workshop. Um, this tool is only going to be trained online moving forward. So right now our model is where we ask our participants to watch our Relias modules, and then we have our didactic online interactive participants. Um, and that's how we are teaching tools. We're training. Um, there's an option for if you're if you want to take this back to your agency, we can train you guys to be a facilitator. So you go through our process, and so that's an option where you can train it live in your own agencies. It takes some steps, but um, that's something that we also facilitate. Is you guys taking that really and being the owner of that material. Um, so, yeah, if you have any more questions, please reach out to us. Um, feel free, email, however you'd like to, to contact us. We can put our contact in there, too. Um, join us for more. Um, we have so many resources, like you, like these podcasts and tools of choice and family coaching workshops. We've got so many things, and we would love to work more with you. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. It was wonderful for you to be here.